What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Broken Tables Podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Vegas, here as always with our reigning, defending, broken predictions champion, King Rome. How you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing good. How's uh, how's Canada? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, I'll say it was great because I had an absolute blast at Forbidden Door, uh, Dynamite, Ramp- Rampage, um, all that, Ring of Honor, you know. Uh, but the traffic there... Worst traffic I've ever dealt with in my life. Uh, some of the worst drivers I've ever dealt with. Um, but the place was absolutely beautiful. Um, in Toronto, we went to like an island called uh, Center Island. And I walked all the way around the thing. It was like five miles. My legs were absolutely destroyed. Um, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful place, man. Absolutely. Nice. Um, so uh, here we are for AEW Dynamite Review for uh, July 5th from Edmonton, Alberta. And man, this was a great episode. And this kind of feels like one of those, when you looked at it on paper, it didn't look like anything that was going to jump out at you. Like it was definitely not one of those, oh, look, we're getting a pay-per-view on Wednesday type thing. But Mm -hmm. man, it turned out to be a freaking fantastic episode, didn't it? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I remember in the Discord, I think a few people were like, oh, this doesn't seem like a very good episode, but I thought it ended up being Really an incredible episode with very little to criticize. There is a little bit, but not really a lot. It was um, it was a great episode with a lot of great stuff, and both on the match side and the promo side. So, Yeah, I 100% agree with that one. Um, I don't know if they've been doing this lately, because I, th- I missed the last uh, Dynamite, you know what I mean, um, since I was, I was there. The, the very, very blue presentation, did they do that last week? Like... The whole opener was very blue lighting, and then the dynamite with, you know, the background was extremely blue as well. I think that there's been a few little subtle undertones that they've kind of slowly put in there, but I think it's just because they're trying to differentiate it from Collision, which is red. Yes, exactly. That's what I was going to get at there. It definitely felt like they were making the show feel much different than Collision, you know? Yeah. All right, this was um, an excellent episode here. I love how they started out with um, Darby Allen kind of confronting Keith Lee, being like, you know, cutting a promo on him, essentially saying, pull your head out of your ass and show me which Keith Lee is going to show up here tonight. Um, At first, I was kind of caught off guard, like, whoa, why are these guys talking? But, you know, they do have a little bit of past. And I thought this was great. Uh, Darby came off pretty good here. It seems like Darby's getting a lot better on the mic, huh? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's about where I've always, I mean, I don't know. I I think it's just with Darby's where he's been at, which is great. It's not a bad thing. It just felt like a little more confidence came out in him tonight. I liked it. I just think it's because it's how they're booking him, how they're presenting him as, you know, top guy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after this, we came up with, uh, orange Cassidy coming out to start off the show essentially. And man, that pop from Edmonton, Alberta was huge for Orange Cassidy. And, you know, I've been seeing it all over Twitter. I'm sure you guys have been saying it in Discord as well. You know, once this guy drops that international title, you know, where where does he go? Do you think he's got to go after the world title? Um, you think they got to rely on this momentum that this guy has? Or, you know, what's your opinion on this? Because I know you're a huge Orange Cassidy guy. I think that there are... So, like, outside of the pillars, I think that there is a group of people in AEW that were not established beforehand, you know, before their time in AEW, but now find themselves, I would say, extremely over and star caliber. Um, Things that, you know, people that come to mind, the acclaimed, the uh, Orange Cassidy, and, and I feel like these are the guys that you need to make sure again, outside of the pillars, that they are mainstays on your product because the fans are responding to the positive. And I think Orange Cassidy has just done such an excellent job with the title. He's really made it extremely important. I mean, it, like there are weeks where it, it feels like the most important title on the show, which obviously you can criticize other parts of the product, but, you know, that's just what it is. It's yeah. He's out here having all of these amazing defenses. And I think that when the time comes for him to drop it, I do think that he needs to go right into another feud, something really hot. You know, like when the acclaimed they drop the, the, the tag titles to the guns, 
they kind of just they're still over and they're still doing stuff and yes they were doing the trios thing which led to the title match so it's not that they're not doing anything but you kind of want to see them be in more of a high profile role. And I really hope that Orange Cassidy can be booked in that way where like, yeah, I, like yeah. I don't know if it needs to be a world title match. I would give him a world title match. Max. I would definitely have him run probably the full gear cycle. I would have him be that guy. I, I think have this Adam Cole MJF thing go until all in or all out have um have eddie kingston at grand slam because it's in new york and then after that you're kind of looking at full gear and you know i would yeah i would have orange cassidy go after eddie kingston um i think that's what i would do that'd be that'd be insane dude that crowd would go nuts yeah and if you're not going to do that then i do think that you absolutely need to have orange cassidy in some sort of high profile after this like yeah he needs to be doing something marquee caliber because there's only so many times that this guy can go out there. And I'm not even just talking about the international title. I'm talking about beforehand. There's only so many times that this guy can go out there and just churn out excellent. I'll just say content because it it's, doesn't matter if it's like in a video package or if it's in the ring or wherever it is. He's always just kind of killing it. Um, what so do you yes, think about- I would absolutely strap a rocket to his back and keep him as one of the top guys. He's consistently selling merch. He's consistently doing well in all these other metrics. That's that's my take on. It. So, what do you think about Orange Cassidy maybe running it back with uh, Adam Cole? Remember um, when you know they basically he basically threw Adam Cole off the uh, the, the top. What was it? The top of the um, tunnel. So you know, I think so. He, I, I I I'd be okay with seeing that, but I definitely think that there are more. There are different places they can go. I, I think AEW is at a point where, you know, it's it's cool to do some, you know, to run some things back. Like I like I like the Owen that they're doing a lot of things like that, where it's like Starks and and Hobbs next uh, or on Saturday. I think that's really cool. But I, at the same yeah. time, like we don't need to run back everything. <laughs> and yeah, and I also was going to point that out. Jeff is really pulling for this Adam Cole heel turn, which it, I don't think they're going to do that anytime it, soon. Um, well, we'll get we'll get to the match later, but it really felt like they're going with what I was saying. So. <laughs> I don't think so at all. Um, but no, I I think, um, yeah, you just you just make it happen. You just do. Yeah. You just do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, we had Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen versus Keith uh, Lee and Swerve Strickland, uh, with the Mogul Embassy out there, man. Um, that that's just a mean looking group, you know. It's that's a big, that's a big, big, big bunch of dudes. I don't, I don't know what else to say there. Uh, so Keith Lee was getting massive, uh, Lee, Lee, Lee chance as well. Uh, th- this was a great match, man. I actually had a lot of fun watching this match. Um, orange Cassidy hitting two orange punches on Keith Lee to try to finally knock him down. Uh, Darby Allen had to hit him with two of, I guess he calls it a springboard coffin drop. Is that what it is when he just kind of springboards off the ring and smashes into him with his back? Yeah, that's kind of... Yeah, I'd say so. They, they don't really ever name it. They just kind of springboard whatever. Yeah. Uh, this match was awesome, man. I love Darby Allen. He's one of my favorite, you know, same thing with Orange Cassidy. You know, we, we, we could almost put Orange Cassidy as like a fifth pillar, man. I, I freaking love this guy. So good. And again, I mean, that's something that I think that AEW has done so well, and they're just so really great at. Like, if if you ask me, like, what is AEW best at? I really do think that it's making people feel like they matter and making stars on your roster. Um, Because there are so many people that would make so many arguments about so many of their favorite wrestlers (laughs) and why they would say that they're a pillar. You know what I mean? Like, Yes, like you could argue that Orange Cassidy is a fifth pillar. You could argue that the, you know, look at, look at, I don't know, I'm scrambled today because dealing with stuff here. But like, there's so many that you could just be like, oh yeah, that's that person's pillar. They've already said it, like Britt Baker is like the unofficial fifth pillar. They've like, you know what I mean? Like you could just go down the list. Ricky Starks has been there since like the early pandemic days, which I just, I consider that to be, early AEW days. You know what I mean? Like there's just so many people. Hold up. Orange Cassidy's 39. Yeah. He's old. We've, we've touched on this in, in the pod before. 
That's crazy, though. It just my it won't stick in my head because of how young he looks, man. That's crazy. He's older than me. What? All right, that's depressing. But no, moving on. Uh, <laughs> um, this was an awesome match again. Um, Swerve Strickland winds up kicking Keith Lee in the head during the match. It actually looked intentional from my point of view. There, I thought it definitely looked intentional instead of an accident. Uh, Orange Cassidy hits a huge DDT on the outside to Keith Lee to keep him out of the ring. Darby winds up hitting the roll up on Swerve with the Last Supper and picks up the one, two, three. Um, honestly, I thought when Swerve and Lee teamed up, they were going to be getting the win and going towards the finals of this. But you know, they got uh, Darby Allen and Orange Cassidy picking up the win here. Um, what do you think? Uh, I thought it was a great match. So we're going to talk about it a few times. Uh, obviously, last week we didn't really do any shows. You were in Canada. Yeah. Um, so we just kind of took the week off. But I I've been so mixed on this Blind Eliminator tournament because, <laughs> like, ugh. like the matchups have been, like, so inconsistently good and inconsistently bad. Where it's like, obviously, you want to do the whole Adam Cole MJF thing. I get that. Obviously, it's pro wrestling. This isn't actually random. This is the Booker, yeah. Tony Khan making these tag teams. And I'm okay with, obviously, the suspension of disbelief that, like, oh my god, wow, MJF and Adam Cole were picked. But you mean to tell me that also randomly, Swerve and Our Glory was formed. Also randomly, Orange Cassidy and Darby Allen, two guys that have been working together quite frequently, were formed as a random team in this random lottery. And then they're like, later, well, again, we'll talk about it later on with like Sammy Guevara and, and um and Daniel Garcia. Yeah. But, like, man, this match was so great, and I love tournaments. I know Ed's like, oh, there's like three tournaments going on, and I'll admit that it, that's that's a lot. But I personally don't mind it as long as they're good. And I thought like, this match was phenomenal. But I was just kind of sitting there shaking my head, like, oh, really? These were two random teams that were drawn out of uh out of the the tumbler thing, the bingo tumbler, like. Yeah, okay. and you know. Right. At the beginning, when they did the drawing of the Matt Hardy and Jeff Jarrett, you know, like I, we kind of gave them praise. You know, we'll get to that in a minute, obviously, but we gave them praise, like, "Hey, cool, they did it. They drew it live on TV." But now, all of a sudden, later on, they just kind of throw it out there that you know Garcia and Sammy were together. It's just, uh, you know, have a little bit of consistency, I guess, is what I was uh, looking for there with these, you know, drawings from, you know, from the the budget, yeah. But I mean, that being said, it, this match was. Drum awesome it was a really fun real, opener. absolutely um there was a lot of really cool spots that i just really loved whether it be the darby allen stuck under the stairs and keith lee walks up oh the dude yes that was insane um I, I loved keith lee in this match i actually thought this was probably one of my favorite keith lee matches in his aw run um just because of how he was kind of working with everyone like his interactions yeah. with darby were really cool the way he comes out there and he just fucking chucks darby to start the match the way he's Dude. doing you know that, his interaction with Orange cassidy how cassidy's like trying to do the mind game he's like wait 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 don't chop me yet all right now you could chop me. and oh, then just dude, like that... oh jesus and then again even the stuff with swerve where it's like i don't know if they're gonna do if this leads to swerve uh versus keith again which is weird because i kind of didn't get the vibes that that's that that's where we're going with it either so it's kind of weird but i mean the match itself i mean uh, it was awesome it was fantastic absolutely uh next up we had a video package from darby uh basically you know a little bit about buddy wayne and how he started out his career you know going to buddy wayne's school of wrestling uh, and then it transitioned to introducing Nick Wayne. Uh, we had a little package for Buddy Wayne's son, Nick Wayne. And if you have never seen it, please, please, please go watch it. It is on YouTube. It is Nick Wayne versus Swerve Strickland um, from a few years ago when this kid was 15 years old. And it's an incredible match. And they later, you know, I just, I got to say it now. It just kind of goes with it. They later announced we are getting Nick Wayne versus Swerve Strickland for his first match. Uh, Rome, did you catch which day this was? Is this on Dynamite? It's on Dynamite, yeah. Oh, my God, man. I can't wait for next week. This kid is amazing. He's now 18 years old. 
his contract with AEW, I believe, is, uh, I guess, in effect now. I guess that would be the, the right way to say it. Mm. Um, and, man, I can't wait for this match. It was great when he was 15. I can't imagine how it is now when he's gotten even better. Yep. All right. Uh, next up, we had uh, Jungle Jack Perry uh, showing up backstage in his uh, SUV. Um, he lets you know he lets them know that he's going to demand an FTW title match from Tony Khan, but Hook comes out of nowhere and annihilates him, uh, and we get another one of those Jungle Boy diving into the uh, SUV spots, and that looks hilarious now that they've done it twice. I absolutely love that spot. Oh, completely. Yep, the Coog threw that out there into uh, the chat DeFi wrestling video. Absolutely. You know what? Let's go to chat real quick and welcome everybody here. We haven't even said anything to chat since we've been back here. I'm sorry, guys. What's up, coach? What's up, Coog? Purpleness is here. Uh, we also got the day trading doge and Ed, of course. Thank you very much for everybody being here. Um, you know, th th this, uh, this, this episode was amazing. I love this spot here with uh, Jungle Jack diving into the SCV again. Um, do you think they're going to keep doing this where he just keeps running from hook for a while? And then finally they're going to do something where he can't run anymore or what? Um, I mean, yeah, uh, this, this was really good too. I really love this. Um, some people, I saw some people on Twitter. I don't want to say that I coined this, but, uh, some people are referring to him as Hollywood Jack Perry. And when Jack came out of that SUV, Ooh, I like it. Yeah. When Jack came out of the SUV, wearing what he was wearing, I was like, damn, that really would stick with the Hollywood, uh, with Hollywood. I really Jack like Perry. it. I think that yeah, might have been I, another I one of his work. dad's and, shirts. And then Jack is even like, um, I'm not some thug from New York like Hook. He's like, I'm going to march to Tony Khan's office right now and demand an FTW championship match. Before he could do that, Hook attacks Jack. Jack dives back into his SUV and the SUV peels away. Um, yeah. It's just great. Just, great. I'm so happy with the, so far. I'm so happy so far with what they're doing with Jack. And yeah. And I understand some people were like caught off guard by the sudden change with Jack, but like, you know, that's how things happen in wrestling back in the day. There's always a sudden heel change. You know what I'm saying? I, it doesn't bother me as much as, as others, I guess. Um, but I thought he nailed it tonight. Actually. Um, I thought he seriously, um, nailed his little promo. He did about marching to Tony Khan's office. Uh, it actually felt believable. And then him getting attacked and him running away was just great. I love it. It's great heel work right now. I think I like it a lot. Yeah. All right. Next up, we had uh, <laughs> we had MJF and Adam Cole uh with a video package of them working out, doing a basically a workout workout session. Um, MJF asks him to spot him on the bench press. MJF spotting what? Let me see if I can do the math. That was one, two, three, three plates on each side. You know what? Let me let coach do the uh, addition for us. Coach, what was the weights on that, that Adam Cole and uh, MJF were pushing? It was three forty fives on each side and obviously 45 for the bar. Do, do, do the math for me real quick, coach. Um, th this was great. So MJF goes to do his and Adam Cole doesn't spot him at all. He just like gets on his phone and starts texting and stuff. Uh, but MJF just does the reps. No problem. Smashes them on there. Three fifteen. Whoo. That was monster. Uh, and you know, MJF offers to spot for Adam Cole and Adam Cole puts up the same, the same exact weight and smashes it. And MJF is just like in awe. He's like, what the, f and they cut away from it. I said, it's so funny because I said the same thing. I thought that Adam Cole took a couple plates off because when they were showing the view of Adam Cole, you could only see one plate at a time on the thing. And when he when he put it back on the rack, you could see he was doing all three plates as well. And MJF was just like, what the? F and I said it along with him. I was like, holy, f it was great. And yeah, coach said the same here. I love how the camera angle doesn't show Adam's weights. Yeah, I popped too, man. I was like, holy shit. You know, everybody tries to say Adam Cole doesn't have the body, but he just right there showed he had the strength. Like that was that was badass. Yeah, no, I thought this was a really uh, a really awesome video package. Again, they're just doing this this MJF Adam Cole thing, man, is such a home run, and we're gonna talk about it in a little bit when when they do the match. But like, man, it's just so good. It's so damn good. Yep. 
All right, next up we had the acclaimed and daddy ass versus the blade and um, the Bollywood boys, which I did not expect. Um, I'm not sure if it was announced ahead of time, you know, but I just got back into the States. I didn't have Twitter while I was driving and all that stuff. Uh, um, it was announced like 20 minutes before the show went on. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I, I didn't see that there. Um, but this was good. I actually enjoyed this. You know, the Bollywood boys were okay back in the day. Um, you know, they're they're decent, I guess. I don't really want to call them jobbers, but that probably is a decent, you know, probably a decent word for them. Um, and the blade is always uh, very good in the ring. So uh, this was a great match. Um, loved, you know, Billy Gunn is always fantastic in the ring. I love how he works the crowd. But man, Billy Gunn just makes everybody look so small when he's in there. He's such a big guy. You know what I mean? Like his chest is just massive. His back is massive. He's, I think he's either 6'2 or 6'3. Um, the dude's a monster compared to, especially the Bollywood boys. He looked like the big show in there. Yeah. For I think sure. I'm stealing that from Ed. I'm not trying to steal it, Ed. I'll give you the credit, but, <laughs> um, so we had a great, awesome hot tag to, uh, Bowens. Bowens runs wild, bunch of super kicks, you know, beats everyone's ass. Everybody loves the acclaimed, um, Daddy ass comes into what with one of the Bollywood boys. And I don't even know what to call this slam, but he had him in like a full Nelson picked him up as high as you could possibly put him and absolutely just power slammed him through the earth. Uh, and then we got the mic drop for the one, two, three. Um, this was a fantastic match and, uh, the acclaimed and daddy ass pick up the win. What did you think of uh, Caster's rap, man? He absolutely destroyed Canada, dude. I wasn't expecting him to uh, to do that. He even got a little bit of a boo there for the Wildfires line and, and you know, the Trudeau line. I mean, you know, it's it's Max. You know, I, I yeah. thought it was a really enjoyable rap. I didn't really have an issue with it. But then again, you're right. I don't live in Canada, so. Yeah. And I got to say, I love how he plays both sides. You know what I mean? Like, he's he, he goes, you know, nobody's safe. You know, just like a comedian should be. Nobody's safe. I like it. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Yep. All right. Well, after the big win here, we had Harley up on the big screen, uh, cutting a promo on basically on Bowens. Um, essentially, she's saying she wants to uh, convert Owens, uh, you know, from being gay, essentially, is what I think some people took from this. And, you know, I, I thought this was enjoyable. I wasn't, uh, you know, I'm to the point with Harley now that she's kind of like, she's done enough of the heel work where I'm not just like, Oh, I love Harley. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, Oh, you know, she's a heel now for me. So it's, it's, you know, I, I do enjoy her heel work and QTV is awesome. And having QT, QT Marshall and Johnny TV together. That's freaking fantastic. I can't wait till we get, you know, get that going on. Um, this was good. What did you think of Harley's uh, little promo here? I mean, yeah, I, I think, I don't really have an issue with it either. Um, you know, it, it's just the ongoing storyline. I thought it was pretty good. It, it, you know, the rampage segment from last week was pretty good. So, you know, I'm, I'm down for more. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, Harley informs them that she made a music video, uh, to follow up on her rap from last week. So we're going to be getting a music video from Harley sometime. Did, did you catch if she said when she just kind of mentioned she made it? She didn't really say when she was dropping it, right? I think she said next week. Next week? Okay. Thanks. Well, uh, we'll, we'll brace for that one uh, when it comes. Um, it's going to be funny. It's got to be hilarious. If not, it's going to be cringe as fuck. <laughs> All right. Next up, we had a package for Eddie Kingston going over to New Japan and winning the New Japan Pro Wrestling Strong Open Weight Championship. And I did not know that this was a thing, man. And I was like absolutely ecstatic when I saw this. Uh, Eddie finally, you know, realizing his dream and winning a championship, man. This was this was awesome. I freaking loved this little video package they had. Yeah, you know, I thought it was really cool for them to do this. So yeah, he won that title this morning um, at their Independence Day Night Two event. Um, and yeah, really awesome moment for him and. Kudos to AEW for kind of celebrating that the same way they did with Willow, which is really good. It, it's, you know, they're your talent. You should be sharing more when they do things like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, so immediately after was a video package um, from Moxley cutting a promo on Eddie saying, you know, he wasn't really congratulating him on uh, winning that championship, but he was, you know, referencing Eddie's career and referencing him winning it. And he said, Eddie, answer your phone. You know what I mean? So it uh, looks like Mox is trying to, uh, you know, mend that fence, I guess, like uh, Renee was yelling at both of them the other day. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see what comes of that. And, you know, while we're on the subject of Mox here, man, what do you think of that that video slash photo going around of the the barbecue skewers getting stuck into the top of his head? Which, for anybody wondering, like, a lot of people are like, what is that, chopsticks? Or, you know, those were barbecue skewers, like you would, you know, buy at the store to put some shrimp on or something. Um, what, what did you think of this? Or, or, did you have a problem with this? Because Mox has been doing this since the beginning of his career. People just didn't Look, really like- know. So, like, I'm not a death man. Me uh, I mean, Me I, I do enjoy, like, extreme wrestling and stuff like that and, like, the whole no whole bard stuff. Yeah. But I'm not, like, a deathmatch guy. Like, you're not going to catch me watching, like, CZW or anything like that. Is, do, like, do I want to see John Moxley like that? Not really. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it, I don't know. I don't want to tell the guy not to do things his way. Cause at the end of the day, like Agreed. you want them to do things their way. Like that was the thing, right. That's like so terrible about WWE is that like you go to WWE and you do things the WWE way. Right. So it's like, I don't want to sit here and just say like, Oh, well Mox should not be doing it. Sting should not be diving off a table. And like, obviously that's two different things. Cause Sting 69 years old. But my my point, I think, is still kind of valid in the sense that, like, obviously, I want them to be taken care of and I don't want anything to happen to them. And, you know, they do need to take care of themselves. But no, I like long, long answer can have a problem with it, even though it's not. For- yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. But like at the same time, when I first saw it, I was like, man, you got a daughter. You know what I mean? Like, that was the first thing that popped into my head. And I was like, one day she's going to be like 12, 13 and. One of her friends is going to be like, do you see this picture of your dad? What the hell? Like, you know, I don't know. It was it just, you know, but I agree. I am definitely not a uh, deathmatch type of guy. And, you know, it didn't bother me as much as it did some, but I, I would rather he not be doing that stuff when he's one of our top guys here, you know. I get it. But, no, I, I totally get it. And yeah, I, I again, I just think the problem is I think there's just so many people who are going to go and sit there and criticize it just because he's, you know, an AW guy. And I, I think that that's kind of in bed. Yeah, I got you. All right. Next up, we had um, them pulling the uh, names out of the drum. It was Renee Paquette and RJ city. And we had Matt Hardy and Jeff Jarrett pulled uh, to be the next tag team together. And Matt Hardy did not seem pleased. He thought it was going to be his brother, Jeff Hardy, uh, but it was Jeff Jarrett. And Matt Hardy said the nuts of slap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, look, and again, like this is what I'm talking about when I say like, this was a great pairing for this tournament. Yes. This was really fun. It's something different. You know, it was like, it's like the, the daddy magic butcher pairing where I was like, that's a really cool pairing. It's like half of yes. the, half of the pairings in this tournament are so cool. And then the other half are just like, oh, wow. Yeah, you just literally sat in a room and, like, you you booked this tournament. You handpicked this tournament. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there needs to be some sort of suspension of disbelief, and I'm just, I'm not feeling it. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, but I completely agree. This was exactly what I was looking for in this tournament, is these oddball pairings. I love how they just said Jeff first, and he was like, oh, Jeff Hardy, my brother? And he was like, no, Jeff Jarrett, you know? And it was like, oh, you know? They did that very well, you know, it's ah, for some reason they didn't continue on with that later on, you know, just some consistency, man. It would have been, and, they almost nailed it. You know what I mean? It's like they almost nailed it. Yeah. And then they kind of again, kind of, so coach just said, it. I was going to bring it up as well, but coach in the chat just said it that like, oh man, so much for not seeing double J again in AEW, which again, I didn't think that they were going to do that as his last match, but yeah. okay, well then they probably shouldn't have let Jeff say that in the video package leading up to the Aubrey match, which just makes me dislike that Aubrey match even more. Cause it's like, okay, man, we're, we are just 
wasted like we just got nothing of value out of that little uh that little few did we um yeah. but yeah all right well next up we had wheeler yuda cutting a nice promo on kenny omega you know explaining how kenny's all beat and bruised and battered and he's beaten him before so i thought this was a great promo by wheeler yuda here yeah uh, what about yeah right i mean it was it was fantastic it just it is what it is you know he's gonna have a match with him later in the night and fantastic promo from uh yuda the the, the philadelphian as you put it yeah right. how did you put that uh well so ed asked his nationality and i said he's philadelphia yeah yeah that's what it was yeah yeah all right next up we had the wizard the ocho chris jericho on the mic uh, in the ring, cutting a very nice, uh, pretty much babyface promo here, um, saying that, you know, Jericho needs a change. He's been having some bad luck lately with a string of loses. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says maybe it's time to change into the best version ever of uh, Chris Jericho. Um, what do you think that means? Is he is he targeting a specific uh, version of himself, or you think he's reinventing? I don't know. I, I think it's kind of... I, they're about to move on with Jericho and do something different with him. And I think he was kind of teasing it in a way that he was going to turn babyface. But he's also kind of probably feeling nostalgic based off where he is. Um, oh, so, yeah, absolutely. You know, but it's kind of leading into the Don thing with Don coming in. So it's understandable. But you also kind of want to get the crowd against Don. So with the with him, with Jericho teasing that he's going to turn babyface, the crowd really likes that. So, of course, when Don comes out and steps on that, that's going to be, you know what I mean? Don Callis with the nuclear heat again when he comes out to uh, interrupt Jericho here. Uh, This crowd would not stop booing him at all, so Callis just pushed through uh, his promo while they were booing him. Um, He essentially asks Jericho to join the Don Callis family. And I think that's the first time that they kind of referenced it like a new faction. Then like, that's going to be the name, the Don Callis family. Mm. I can't wait to get that shirt with him and Takeshita, like with the centaur. I think it's Takeshita. That's the centaur and Don riding on his back. Isn't Mm -hmm. that what it is? Yeah. I hope we get a shirt that says the Don Callis family, dude. That's going to be so, oh yes. Um, and Jericho kind of says, you think I want to join your faction? He's like, Jericho doesn't join factions. He creates them. But maybe. And I was very surprised. I thought he was just going to be like, nope. But he says maybe and walks out of the ring. So he kind of leaves Don Callis hanging and uh, he says maybe and we'll see what's going to happen there. Um, w- what would you think if he actually joined the Don Callis family? I mean, I think Brian Danielson being hurt makes me think that Jericho is going to be the fifth man for blood and guts. So I kind of am leaning in the direction that I do think he's going to join. That's just me personally. Okay. Yeah, I I, I think he might actually join as well, Um, especially with what happens a little bit later in the night with uh, Sammy and um, Garcia confronting Jericho. You know, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, But yeah, I think he might join as well. Uh, next up, we had a CM Punk and uh, Samoa Joe promo package that, oh man, just, you know, every time we see CM Punk, you know, we we absolutely love it. Um, and I think this was the first time I've heard anybody ever call CM Punk Punker. So when Joe got to his part of the video package, he, he, you know, he, he called CM Punk Punker. I like that a lot. Um, I might have to use that. Dude, um, I, can't I can't believe we're getting Punk versus Joe. For free right one. away, yeah. Like, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, Punk's just gonna, he wants to go 100 miles an hour here, man. I, I love it, man. Just absolutely amazing. Can't wait for that. Uh, next up, we had a quick Starks versus Hobbs preview for the uh, the next round of that tournament. Um, next up, we had Roderick Strong in a neck brace backstage with Renee Paquette and Doc Sampson. Um, they were essentially giving an update on Roderick Strong's neck, which he was in a neck brace, but he was kind of saying he was fine. Adam Cole shows up saying, you know, you got to make sure you're fine. Kind of referencing what happened with him and his concussion, you know, take the time, make sure you're good before you come back. Um, and that led right into the MJF and Adam Cole, uh, you know, versus, uh, daddy magic and the butcher and dude. This match was so freaking fun. 
I had so much fun watching this MJF and Adam Cole match. And dude, MJF is playing a baby face at the moment. You know, it still seems like he he's a heel, but he's pretending to be a baby face. I think I even saw him high-fiving the kids in the audience on his way down the ramp, you know. Oh, and, completely. And he does the he does the boom thing with Adam Cole. Like, so he gets down below him when he does the boom and does it with him. They get in the ring and MJF also does the Adam Cole baby thing, but he does it from his knees the same way he does it for himself. This entrance was absolutely fucking fantastic, dude. This is one of my favorite entrances in wrestling, the way that they were like simultaneously doing the baby stuff. And uh, it was great. Um, so this was also followed by a freaking awesome match with the focus of this match was MJF trying to get Adam Cole to do heel things. Uh, so MJF would put, you know, someone in an abdominal stretch and he came over right next to Adam Cole and was like, grab my hand. And he was audibly yelling these things. And Cole's like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and MJF gets the crowd to chant. He's like, do it. Do it, do it, dude! I freaking loved this so much. I popped. I started chanting with him while he was doing it in my own house, like a freaking Mark sitting here. <laughs> um, absolutely loved it. A eventually, Adam Cole gives in and does grab his hand and pulls. So, yep, yeah, I gotta ask, do you think that they're gonna have like MJF like turn Adam Cole heel? No. So, look again. I said earlier, this storyline is a complete home run. And absolutely. I'm absolutely in love with it. Like, just completely in love with it. Yeah. Um, that being said, uh, and I, well, before I say that, I also think that I really want to see MJF and Adam Cole win the World Tag Team Champion. Wow, the Coog says one of the best AEW segments I've ever seen. And Juhas is here and Michael Duke. What's up, fellas? Um, yeah, that was one of the best segments I've seen in a long time as well, man. That. The entire thing from Roderick Strong in the locker room with the neck braced, Adam Cole walking in to the end of this match was just absolutely incredible. Like this was this was what Dynamite is made of, you know what I mean? This is why you picked up Adam Cole and oh my god, this is this was great. I loved this tr tremendously. Yeah. Um so I, I think that I don't think Adam Cole is going to turn heel. I don't think MJF is going to turn face. I do think this is going to end up with MJF uh, turning on on Adam Cole. Okay. I think that there are little things that they're going to do. I really like the storyline because it's kind of like Adam Cole is very trepidatious. He's like, you're MJF and I know who you are and I know what you do. And, and MJF is going to keep trying to do these things where like, okay, so MJF wants Adam Cole to wear this shirt. MJF wants to do a double clothesline. Right now, Adam Cole is not doing any of it. I guarantee you, as the tournament goes on, he's going to wear the shirt, and he's going to do the yeah. double clothesline. He's going to do these things, and it's going to be great. Um, yeah, so as soon as MJF tagged Adam Cole in, we didn't get MJF back in. Adam Cole finished him off with the, uh, the boom and picked up the win. And... I saw people saying MJF looked pissed. I didn't think he looked pissed. I thought he looked proud. Like, you know, he he he's he weakened him enough to where Adam Cole could finish him off, right? Yeah, that's what he wa yeah, MJF does not want to wrestle. No, MJF yeah, MJF that's a great point. I didn't even think of that part. Yeah, MJF doesn't want to wrestle. That was exact yeah, he he exactly Trust he, me, he, that's what he wanted. MJF is happy because everything is going exactly the way he wants it to. Adam Cole is is uh is buying in. Adam Cole doesn't mind wrestling. Adam Cole doesn't mind picking up the win. Like, you know, everything's going MJF's way. Nice, nice. Michael Duke says, uh, it's official, becoming a certified athlete, athlete softball coach. Nice, man. Congratulations. That's cool to hear. I was uh, the number one ranked uh, young, what was I? I was 11 years old in the state of Mississippi. I was the number one ranked player for like a year. So, of baseball, not softball, but, you know. Uh, so yeah, this was absolute perfection. Love this. Um, MJF is just absolute gold. Anytime he is on the mic in the ring, it's just, it's unbelievable. So, uh, MJF demands, uh, two microphones, gets him and Adam Cole on the mic and MJF says happy birthday to Adam Cole. 
and has a huge celebration for him. Massive streamers get blasted through the air. Uh, has a bunch of guys come out with cakes and uh, hats and stuff like that. And Cole's like, I'm totally going to smash his face into the cake to the camera. But Adam Cole turns it around on him and smashes MJF's face into the cake. Um, this was fantastic, man. And, you know, MJF agrees. Or I'm sorry. Adam Cole agrees to another uh, bro day out, you know, maybe working out or doing something else. I'm not sure what they'll do in the next one, but it should be fantastic, man. Absolutely love what's going on between these two. All right, next up, we had Britt Baker, Dr. Britt Baker, I'm sorry, uh, DMD, uh, with Renee Paquette cutting a, a great promo on Ruby Soho here. Um, you know, Britt Baker just looks like a star, man. Like, I love that jacket she wears. Just everything about Britt Baker's presentation and everything is just 100%. She's one of our, you know, she's definitely one of those, like we said, the, one of the fifth pillars or whatever you want to call it. She's... The face of that women's division. Absolutely love Britt. This was a great promo. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, next up is when we had Jericho uh, with Sammy Guevara and um, Daniel Garcia. They were asking Jericho, what's going on? Why would you say maybe to Don Callis's family thing? Uh, you know, they're like, we need you. And Jericho basically was like, no, you don't need me. He's like, you guys don't need to be under my wing forever. And I 100% agree with what Jericho is saying. I think we've all been waiting for the turn from Sammy and Garcia. You know what I mean? Uh, do you think we're actually going to see a turn from maybe both of them at the same time? Cause it looks like they're turning into a tag team again. You know, they announced them that they were two random picks that again, like you said earlier, these random picks didn't feel random at all. You know, there was like three teams that just, it didn't feel random, you know, but whatever with that, you know, it's, it is what it is. And do you think they're going to turn on Jericho and maybe uh, take him out one day? I don't know, but I mean, I will say this, that for like, if this is them kind of wrapping the JAS up and just kind of getting rid of it without really any closure for Sammy or for Garcia, I'm not really super down for it. Admittedly. Um, let me throw this at you. The first feud for the Don Callis family uh, that's outside the elite part right here. What do you say that, um, you know, Jericho starts to get beat down by Garcia and uh, Sammy and the family comes out to assist Jericho. And then the rest of the JAS comes out to help Garcia and Sammy. And we get like a little quick feud of the family versus um, the rest of the JAS that's left. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess I could work. It, it, it just, it honestly, it re it reeks of Brian Danielson has a, broke his arm yeah. and we need someone to kind of slot in, in that fifth slot. And we don't want to do, yeah. we don't know who else we're going to do Yeah, because I, I can't, I can't give it a down because it, you know, it feels like it's Danielson got pulled out. You know what I mean? No. But yeah. It, it and still I'm not, feels, I'm not, you know, it was still nice. I'm not fully giving it a down. Uh, but it, I mean, I don't know. So I, I would have done this differently then I would have done this in a way where, and they could probably still do it that way, but I would have, if Jericho was going to join the Callis family, I would have Jericho turn on the JAS. Like I, I wouldn't do this whole, like I can't be there for you forever. Like push you out the nest kind of thing. Like, I don't know because yeah. I don't know who that Ben, who doing that benefits way, because if Jericho is joining the Don Callis family, he needs to be a heel and that's kind of a baby face way of breaking up a group. So, yeah. and, and like really with the JS, the idea should be that the, some of the younger guys, obviously not everyone needs to come out of it looking better, but you would kind of hope that some of the guys that you look at in a singles capacity to be a big deal, like Garcia and Guevara, you kind of want to see them leave the JAS better than when they went into the JAS. And yeah, I mean, if that's how the JAS, JAS disbands, I don't think either guy really could say that that's the case for them. Um, well, I would agree with Sammy. I think Sammy was, you know, in a better place when he was the TNT champion back in the day. But I, I think Garcia's at a really good spot right now. He gets a lot of cheers when he's doing those dances and, you know, the crowd gets into it. I think he might be, you know, if anything, I think he's still where he was. You know, I don't think he's gotten hurt at all, you know? 
Mm -hmm. But this was nice. Uh, We'll see where this goes. We'll see if Jericho uh, joins the Don Callis family. I I like the name, man. It just... It doesn't exactly like roll off the tongue, but I still like it. It's it's nice. Uh, so yeah. next up we had Britt Baker, DMD versus Ruby Soho. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, that presentation of uh, Britt Baker's entrance, fantastic, presented as a freaking megastar, uh, as she should be. Um, and she proceeded to have a freaking awesome match here with uh, Ruby Soho, man. I actually thought this was a great match especially with Tony Storm and uh, Soraya getting involved as much as they did. It didn't bother me at all because I think this was the correct outcome. Um, You know, basically the outsiders interrupted multiple times, you know, uh, causing, you know, some two counts and uh, stuff like that. Um, But we had Tony Storm grab Britt's original Owen title and she puts it on the turnbuckle, causing them to smash Britt's face into it. Then she hits a no future, but only got the 2.999. Ruby does get a roll-up pin on Britt, where Soraya and Tony Storm both get the assist by uh, grabbing onto her hand and pulling. And they all get the win. Um, That's the one, two, three right there with, you know, a great match, man. It was a great back and forth. Even the picture in picture was decent for this one. Um, You know, I had had no problems with the match whatsoever, and I think this was uh, the right outcome. So I, I actually do have a problem with the match. Um, okay. I, let me let me back up. So I think that this is Ruby and Brits out of their. I think this is their third or fourth match together. I think I like this one the best. I think this one was it was a really good match in and of itself. Yeah. That being said, um, why are we still at this point where? And I know Jamie's hurt. I get it. But yeah. why? What happened to the AEW original? Like. Where are they that the outcasts are still just able to completely run rough shot and just do whatever the hell they want? Like, why wasn't Sheeta there? Why did yep. Sky Blue not come out until the end of the match because she's facing Ruby in the next round of the tournament? Why, like, Willow lost in Japan, so it makes sense for Willow not to be there. Yeah. Tone, or, um, Jamie's hurt. It makes sense for Jamie not to be there. But you like you mean to tell me that none of these babyface AW women are gonna back up Britt Baker? Like this is um this is geek babyface syndrome that the yeah. women's roster has just been dealing with. They are for, in like, Canada the too, longest you know, time, so. and it's like again like I, that bothers. Yeah, I I agree. You know, there's a lot of excuses we could throw out there, you know, like they were in Canada, you know, a lot of injuries right now, kind of pause the story. Um, But I do agree with you. Um, Somebody needs to, they need to form that group. We've formed the outcasts a long time ago. Like, where's the originals? We need that. Yeah, exactly. The problem is with with this feud is, is that, and again, I think this comes down to Tony Khan. One of his biggest downfalls is he's notorious for, being stubborn with his booking in a sense that like, if he has a plan, he's going to put everything on hold. Yeah. If somebody's hurt or somebody's unavailable, like the Julia Hart turn that took forever all because Ray Phoenix pro- like broke his arm. You know what I mean? Like they, they literally made us wait three months longer for that. Just be, just because they wanted to get the Lucha bros back in there to finish that, that storyline. Like there's just so many things that they do that they just, you know, that Tony's just like, no, we have like, this is my vision. And I respect that. Like, but at some points you need to make sure you're not ruining your story. Um, and again, so it's like, once again, the outcasts just make the AEW originals look like a bunch of geeks, a bunch of idiots. It's like, and, and I think for me, the, the thing that really kind of puts it like cements it where I'm like, like, okay, I have to have an issue with it at this point. And like, and I wasn't even going to bring it up at first. But then when they have Sky Blue come out after the match, so Sky Blue yeah. is there and Sky Blue is is watching the match. And Sky Blue has been feuding with the outcast. Why is Sky Blue not out there to back up Brit? And I guess you could argue that, like, well, Brit's in the tournament, so it's like he doesn't like I don't know. But that I, don't, I think that kind of has some holes in it. I don't think that really holds up. So it's like. I- I agree. Yeah, I agree. It's it's probably my biggest issue with this show. 
Like, I thought the show was generally great because, like you said, I'm not going to knock the Danielson stuff or the Jericho stuff because I think it's because of Danielson being hurt. But, like, this is the one thing on the show where I'm just like, this this is just not checking out for me. Now, even bare minimum, where's uh, Reba? You know what I mean? Or Rebel? Like, yeah. bare minimum, she needs somebody in her corner knowing that it's three on one. You know what I mean? That's where... Yeah, they need to form this uh, originals group. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it seemed like they pseudo feud, uh, pseudo formed it, but just needs something else to get it there. You know? Yeah. One of us. One of us. <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, Ruby gets the win there. Sky Blue con- comes out to confront her. Uh, they just kind of have a face to face at the top of the ramp. Nothing special. Um, Sky Blue looks amazing. Uh, now, did you see Kyle Fletcher's response to Jungle Boy's promo from last week where he said, I'm, you know, banging the hottest bitch in this place? Mm-hmm. He was like, I disagree. <laughs> Kyle that? Fletcher, because he's now with uh, Sky Blue. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was like, I disagree. <laughs> that was great, dude. I loved it. All right. Next up, we had Wheeler Yuta versus Kenny Omega. And, you know, I came back. A second too late. I saw I was in the middle of uh, Wheeler Yuta's entrance. Was there something before Yuta coming out? Did I miss anything? No. No? Okay. So, yep, we had Wheeler Yuta's entrance first, and then Kenny Omega getting a absolutely massive pop in Alberta, Canada here. Um, Kenny is so beloved in Canada. It's not even funny. Absolutely love it. Um, And this is, I believe, where they announced, you know, Nick Wayne versus Swerve Strickland will be happening next week. Um, just as the match was about to start, they announced this. I kind of wrote it down on the side, like, oh my God, I can't wait for this. I'm so happy they're doing this right away. Um, and the story of this match, man, I absolutely loved it. Cause so many people had a problem with that tiger driver 91 that, uh, Will Ospreay hit on Kenny dropping him on his head. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you don't know. No, finish your thought. Cause I'm just going to rebuttal. Like, so. It was just great to see Kenny selling his neck the entire mm-hmm. match. I absolutely loved that. I loved it. Okay, so the the Tiger Driver 91 folk, right? The the, yeah. the people that are super upset about them running this move. Uh, again, I'm always going to point out bad faith uh, in the wrestling community, especially, obviously, yeah. the IWC. Those same people. It's really funny, Jeff, because that energy was definitely not matched especially at Money in the Bank on Saturday with that table spot with Ricochet and uh, and what was it, Logan Paul. Uh, yeah. I, I just think that it's just everyone making a big fuss about the Tiger Driver and all that. Like that, again, that's just bad faith. That's just people just yeah. going out there. <laughs> it's the truth. People, <laughs> it, people are trying to make it seem like, oh, they're super worried about his safety and his, and his well-being when it, that's not what it's about. That's not at all what it's about. It's yeah. about the fact that he is an AEW guy and people are going to make it seem like AEW is such and such. And that, in my opinion, is bad faith. Yeah. But I, I absolutely loved this. Uh, Kenny went to go do his uh, You Can't Escape and, you know, he couldn't finish the front flip, you know, springboard front flip off the gr- uh, off the mat there. He kind of fell sideways and he slammed the mat because he was upset he couldn't do it. Uh, This was great. And Kenny just kept selling the neck from that point on. Yuda was hitting suplex after suplex. It was almost like a suplex city going on out there. Uh, But eventually Kenny makes a beautiful comeback hitting two snapdragons. Uh, Yuda countered the third one, but he eats a V trigger. Um, Yuda tries out that seatbelt, but he couldn't quite grab on to the ankle of uh, Kenny. Um, Yuta gets hit with another V trigger for 2.999 count. And this is where Don Callis showed up and about 20 security guards trying to hold him back. So while the referee was distracted with Don Callis being held back by security, uh, Takeshita showed up and Takeshita hit the least devastating move of all time onto Kenny Omega, the blue thunder bomb, which has never defeated anyone ever. Um, and it also caused Wheeler Yuta to hit a huge frog splash off the top rope, but Kenny does kick out of this one at 2.9999 and Kenny Omega 
winds up picking up Wheeler Yuta for a massive one-winged angel. He picks him up from the top rope after kind of punching him through his legs. It looked really cool the way he did it. It was almost like a shore you can like uppercut, but he hit Wheeler like through his legs and then into his face. It was great. So real quick, I don't want to take away from the match, but Ed says I don't use the term bad faith correctly. And I looked it up. And so the definition I'm reading tells me that both Ed and myself are both correct. It says <laughs> bad faith is a sustained form of deception, which consists of entertaining or pretending to entertain one set of feelings while acting as if influenced by another. So while Ed, yes, you are correct that it is a form of deception, which I don't disagree with, that second part of the definition is what I'm talking about, where it's like you're acting in a, in a sense that like, like we'll use the tiger driver for an example. You have these people who are just like wrestlers need to be safe and take care of themselves. Like I can't believe that they would do this over in that company. And they're not doing, they're not saying that because they actually care about Kenny Omega's health and well-being. They're saying that because they hate AEW for existing and are going to make arguments that they don't even necessarily believe or care in. Yeah. And that's what I mean, and that's why, according to this definition, we are both correct, Ed. So we will take this. We'll both uh, pick up a win on this. I'll get. I'll give it to you. <laughs> All right, so Kenny does pick him up off the top rope after that sure you can through the groin and uh, picks up the one-winged angel for the win, one, two, three. Uh, but immediately, Claudio Castagnoli attacks with Takeshita, um, and the Elite come out with the Hangman and uh, the Bucks come out with chairs. Uh, they destroy everybody with the chairs, and we get a huge BTE trigger onto Claudio. And just as we're going off the air... We got the hangman with a chair and we got the bucks holding Claudio and Claudio's about to just get absolutely annihilated. And as hangman's about to take the swing, the dark order show up and evil Uno rips the chair out of hangman's hands and we go off air. So I have not seen anything uh, of what happened afterwards. Have you found anything that happened afterwards yet? Um, I can look, hold on. Yeah, no, no worries, but it was great. I, I'm actually enjoying the Dark Order back into this feud a little bit. They are being a little more serious, like I was asking a few months ago. Um, you know, they need to have a little bit of a heel turn type thing, and you know, they just need to be a little serious. And I'll be all, I'll be all in back on the Dark Order. Love it. Love me some Evil Uno. Oh, I gotta put my mask back up. It's still in my brief, still in my uh, suitcase. Uh, but yeah, this was a absolutely fantastic match and a great way to go off the air. You know, this, this storyline with the elite is just one of the best parts of AEW. It always has been, you know? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. All right. So I absolutely loved the ending to this. I love the entire episode. There was a couple of little things to nitpick here and there, but you know, like I said earlier, you know, on paper, this didn't look like it was going to be the greatest episode ever, but it turned out to be freaking fantastic episode of Dynamite. I cannot wait for Nick Wayne versus Swerve. So speaking of next week, uh, you want to go ahead and give us the rundown of what we got for uh, Rampage and possibly anything announced for Dynamite? Yeah. Uh, all right. So everything that was announced, I mean, first of all, they talked about uh, Blood and Guts. They've named four. Each team has four members already named. Uh, the BCC is Yuda, Claudio, Mox, and Takeshita with a fifth mystery uh, partner. The Elite is the Bucks, Kenny, and Hangman with a fifth mystery partner, and that's taking place on July 19th. Coming up on Saturday on Collision. Um, see, they were all over the place. I got everything that was announced, but bear with me. Uh, yeah, so you're good. For Collision this Saturday. Uh, AW World Tag Team Championship, Ed, uh, Ed, I just looked down at the chat, sorry. FTR and Juice, uh, versus Juice Robinson and Jay White. Uh, Owen semifinal, Athena versus Willow. Owen uh, semifinal, Ricky Starks versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Uh, another semifinal for the men, CM Punk versus Samoa Joe. Uh, coming up on Friday on Rampage, it is episode 100 of Rampage. Uh, the Blind Eliminator Tag Tournament will be Matt Hardy and Jeff Jarrett versus Sammy and Garcia, which, again, very disappointed in that second pairing. 
this next match really interesting and cool uh because it's another blind eliminator uh brian cage and big bill are teaming up to face trent and matt seidel that's really cool dude brian cage and big bill as a team holy shit yeah um Kara Shida versus marina shafir will be on rampage and then there's a trios rematch uh, the Hung Bucks versus Dark Order on Rampage. So I'm very intrigued to see which of these four matches ends up being a squash. Because, I mean, I guess Sheeta versus Shafir. I, like, I don't even know. That's a packed episode of Rampage. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen there. Damn. <laughs> and then next week on Dynamite, Orange Cassie and Darby Allen will take on the winner of the Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Garcia, Guevara match. Uh, MJF and Adam Cole will take on the winners of the other match. Ruby Soho will take on Sky Blue in a semifinal. And next week, oh, two more matches. Uh, Nick Wayne will make his debut next week against Swerve Strickland. And Chris Jericho will be taking on Commander. Man, can you imagine Christian being one of the first uh, feuds for Nick Wayne? <laughs> Christian's like in TK's office, like, you gotta give me Nick. Oh, man, it's. That's going to be wild. So your dad's dead. Christian's got a lot. Christian has so much like things to work with in AW with these young guys that I hate to say it, but the young guys that have lost their dads, like he could go on a spree of destroying these kids, dude. I know. <laughs> it's so sad, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel unless they're all cool with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> got negative one coming up in the next few years as well. Mm -hmm. Like, God, I, oh. It'll be the most nuclear heat we've ever seen, dude. It'll be it'll be worse than Don Callis heat if he goes after negative one. Yeah. All right. Well, that was a great episode. Um, great rundown. Um, you want to go ahead and uh, what? Anything you want to talk about? Um, I feel like there was something, but I forgot. I'm not sure. No, about, I think I, how about that's... money, money in the bank. That you know, um, did you uh? Was there anything else? I, I actually didn't see anything about it. I, I completely forgot that that was even a thing this weekend. I don't know. I mean, people are upset that Ray, uh, that Jey Uso pinned uh, Roman. Oh, that was the correct call. He should have pinned him. Yeah, um, I mean, some people are saying they want Jey Uso to beat Roman for the title. So I actually didn't see anything. What happened with that table spot with Logan Paul you were talking about with Ricochet? It was a... um. I mean, I, just, I, I didn't even get to see it because it was I didn't see any clips on Twitter. Okay. But I, I did see a lot of people comparing the two spots where it's like, I mean, you don't have a problem with this, you don't have a problem with that. Eh. Um, but I'll I think, have to go check out a clip or something. I think Ricochet uh... landed pretty nasty on the table. It was, it was uh, the tables were light, were uh, stacked outside the ring. Okay. And I think Logan and Ricochet took a tumble off a ladder, if I recall. I'm not oh, 100% sure. Um, but I'm also not going to criticize the spot person because again, I got you. Yeah, I no didn't worries. see it. I'll go check but, it out. I was in the middle of driving back from Canada, so I'll have to check out the clip. Yeah, but I did see some people kind of say that it's like, hey, well, you know, and, you and I, I was only asking Ed because he he had referenced the spot. I was, you know, just I was just wondering because I didn't get to see anything. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of funny though. Ed's like, how about Money in the Bank, bro? What are your thoughts <laughs> on the the last WWE pay per view? Well, I can safely assure you that. Apart from little things I picked up on Twitter, uh, I did not watch it. Ed says it was an ugly spot. It was an ugly um, spot. I did see yeah. a picture of Logan Paul's back as I was scrolling Twitter earlier today. His back looked jacked, so whatever happened probably didn't look great, but I'll, I'll check it out. But uh, thank you guys very much for joining us on our uh, night back after the week off. You know, we didn't plan that week off because my internet at the hotel was absolutely horrific, but, you know, I did enjoy the vacation there. So thank you guys very much for being with us here tonight. And uh, Rome, you want to go ahead and close us out, sir? Absolutely. Well, this has been, Oh yeah. All in, uh, gonna, they're going to set the all time attendance record for wrestling. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. We're already at mm -hmm. 75. Aren't we? Yeah. We're like, um, we're very close to 75. If we haven't hit 75, I think we did. Let me double check. That was sure what they... we talked about that. I forgot. Um, yeah. They updated the numbers. It said 75,000 and they have another 12,000 available now. Is that what I saw? Let's see. So the latest number that came through, came through yesterday via wrestle ticks. I'm pulling it up real quick. And yesterday, 
Uh, he had said that tickets just distributed 74,888. That's close enough to 75,000 for me. And I think there is about 12,000 more. They opened up almost everything. I saw the upper decks were opened up and it looks like they opened that whole place up, man. Well, so here's something just to kind of keep note of. So the top three uh, wrestling attendances on record. Number three is WrestleMania three with 75,700. Number two is SummerSlam 92 with 78,927. And WrestleMania 32 is number one at 79,800. And I mean, I'm just going to say it. They haven't announced any matches yet, but when they do, I really think they're going to they're going to beat that number. I think they're going to be the all time highest drawn crowd for a wrestling. Yeah, um, they already beat. Well, it hasn't happened yet, so you can't say they beat number three yet, but they're already past number three, I think. I mean, we don't have an update number for all we know, because that when so when those numbers came out from WrestleTix uh, at that point, they had just opened up the rest of the top level. Nice. Oof. Why does the WCW New Japan show always get off the? <laughs> Are you talking about the North Korea show? Because that does not count. The North Korea show did not count. That was a show. Okay, so here's the thing, Ed. <laughs> I think Ed's ble- uh, referring to Collision in Korea, which was a show that was in North Korea. Uh, it was, it was really ran by <laughs> WCW. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's what he's talking about because Antonio no- Inoki was part of that show as well. The thing you got to understand, Ed, is nobody talks about that show because those were not tickets that were sold willingly to the people. That was a dictator who said, you're going to fill the stadium up or we're going to kill you and your family. That doesn't yeah, look, help. That doesn't Ed is help. like, what an L take. Come on, Ed. <laughs> it was a wrestling show with humans in the stands. That's so, insane okay. that you count that. That. It's not attended. Like, that's not a, that, like, people didn't buy those tickets, or maybe they did, but at the end of the day, like, they were forced to go there by a dictator. They were like, like, Listen. how can you, how can you sit here and count that as, like, <laughs> oh no, the those poor people were forced to watch wrestling. <laughs> the funny thing is, yes, Ed, that was probably one of the best days of their lives as a North Korean, but it doesn't matter because nobody, like, you choose to go to WrestleMania. You choose to go to All In. You choose to go to these wrestling shows. Those people at that wrestling show had no choice in whether they went or did not went. And therefore, it completely disqualifies it from any contention of being talked about. Yeah, that's like counting a 0% speed run where someone just glitches at the very beginning of the game and like beats the game in like two seconds. And they're like, yeah, I speed run the game. I'm like, that's like counting that, you know? Best day of their lives. You got 100% that shit. Jeff, this is why I would like for us to do a watch-along series of, like, uh, Dark Side of the Ring, because you haven't watched any of them, and the episode on Collision in Korea is so good. It's so, so good. I'd be down Um, with that. But yeah, it's it's a great show, and it's a really interesting episode, and it's a really interesting event in the history of pro wrestling. But, however, Ed, like I said, it doesn't count. Ed said, that's, that's a terrible analogy, Jeff. It, it might have been. It, it made sense in my head before I, yeah, it, before it, it came look, out it, of my. It's not like Jeff, stop helping me. Um, I'm I can I, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, give those give oppressed the people, people their, their moment. moment. No, how about this? No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this one up here. Um, thank you guys again for joining us. Go ahead and uh, close us out there, Rome. Absolutely. Well, this has been episode 155 of the Broken Tables podcast. Uh, if you like this, please like and subscribe. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks to everybody in the chat, uh, including the Coog, Michael Duke, the coach. Uh, shout out to Ed for uh, consistently bringing the bad takes. Uh, obviously, it's a key part of the show, and we, as usual, really appreciate it. Uh, you can follow us on our social medias in the description down below. You know, Jeff, I actually just downloaded um, Threads. I don't know if you're gonna if you're gonna fuck around with that, but I downloaded What's Threads. It. So Threads is um, Meta's Twitter, and a lot of people are signing up. For it. It's actually doing I'll, very well. I'll it's check it out. Maybe yeah, I, I signed up for it. I started following a few people that I follow on Twitter. I'm not even sure if I'm gonna use it, but I just want to kind of have something lined up in case Twitter kicks the bucket. Which God, these days, these days, who fucking knows? Twitter is just a mess. So, but yeah, no, it seems pretty cool. The only thing about it that I don't like, Jeff, is that 
they haven't and they said they're working on it so i'll i'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're gonna fix it but right now it's kind of more so algorithm based your feed gives you who you follow but also like the for you stuff um whereas like me i want to like just see who i'm following just give me my follow you know what i mean and they said that they're working on that so when they get that i'm definitely going to kind of hop over and try to figure it out anyways um yeah something to keep an eye on but yeah um i got everything thanks everybody episode all right good to go all right and yeah are you good for saturday night after collision for the pod yes Right on. We will see you guys Saturday night after Collision, uh, immediately after the show, just like tonight after Dynamite. Uh, So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And Top Guys, out.